Germany's um, role in, in Europe today, its growing influence, and um, its leadership. Nonetheless, this is uh, a quite novel uh, situation in German foreign policy. After the Second World War, Germany has been working tirelessly to try to refashion itself as essentially as a good international citizen. A country that would act in concert with France and its other neighbors in Europe and also a staunch and strong supporter of, of NATO. So in a sense a country that would really um, not act alone and unilaterally in foreign affairs, but within a strong Western framework, and also a country that would strongly abide by international law and also a quite loyal supporter of the United Nations. And just to give you a sense of how German role in international affairs post-1945 has been seen or talked about just let me give you three possible ways of describing Germany's um, foreign policy post-1945. An American political scientist, uh, Richard Rosecrans, a number of years ago described Germany as a trading state, essentially. And what did he mean by that? What he was referring to was to a country that was really not willing or not able to play power politics any longer. The scar of the wars were far too strong and therefore German policymakers, German leaders, the way they envisaged a German role in international affairs was essentially by trying to um, grow economically, becoming more influential in economic terms, but really shying away from hard power and, um, and power politics. Another way of describing, sorry, this second point, another way of describing Germany's role in international affairs, um, more recently, has been uh, through the concept of geoeconomic power. Germany has been seen by some IR analysts as a quintessential geoeconomic power. Again, here the emphasis is on Germany not really able or willing to engage in power politics, but nonetheless um, a power which is willing to increase its economic power and capabilities. But here this, there's a difference between these two ways of looking at Germany. While in Richard Rosecrans' um, view of Germany as a trading state, the underlying assumption that basically Germany was a benign state, a state that yes, would simply want to become wealthier and, and richer and that's it for no particular reason. In this understanding of geoeconomic power, which was a concept first coined by Edward Lutwak, which is um, a strategic study, a quite famous one in the United States, a strategic hawk, you could call him, and then by, later on by a German um, IR scholar, Hans Kunnani, here the idea is actually a little bit less benign, perhaps, because geostrategic the concept of geostrategic power implies the attempt by, by Germany and by its leaders to acquire economic power for then to exert influence in first and foremost in, in Europe. So here you can see that there's a slight um, shift in the perceptions of, of of Germany. And finally, another way of looking at Germany's foreign policy post-1945 is through the concept of a civilian, a civilian power. 
Again, here the idea is of a country who has abandoned power politics, uh, who strongly believes in international law and um, the United Nations, a country who believes in multilateral in institutions as well as in economic cooperation, and also a country who strongly believes in uh, the ability of shaping international norms for the, the sake of peace and stability in international affairs. So you can see how the, uh, Germany's role in international affairs post-1945 has been seen and um, outlined by a number of IR scholars. Hans Moll is a quite famous German uh, IR um, scholar. So what I'll be looking at today is uh, really uh, essentially focus on two key moments in, uh, in, in German foreign policy. The first one is really the post-war period, the years that coincide with the premiership or chancellorship of Konrad Adenauer, the German chancellor in, in German political lingo, the chancellor is the prime minister, one of the longest serving German prime ministers, he, he, he ruled Germany from 1949 to 1963, although I should say ruled over West Germany rather than Germany um, as we um, understand it today. I'll try to briefly focus on his vision and his foreign policy because to some extent he really laid the foundation of German, Germany's role in international affairs and also the way in which he went about rehabilitating the country through um, a close alignment with the West, which is generally referred to as Westpolitik, which means um, you, the orientation towards the West, or Westbindung, which means the link with the West. The second period that uh, I'll be looking at is the post-1989 period, the end of the Cold War and after. Here again, the other towering figure in German politics as well as foreign policy is Helmut Kohl, who was German Chancellor from 1982 to 1998. Again, in uh, a rapidly shifting international um, scenario. Again, German leaders relied on very well tried um, strategies, Westpolitik and Westbindung again as a way of tying Germany more closely to the rest of Europe. And I guess it's also under call that the, uh, the foundations um, were laid for um, the emergence of, of Germany as a growingly influential actor in, in, in Europe. But let me start from really the foreign policy of what I would, well, how would I call it, the foreign policy of a defeated power. I cannot overemphasize um, this point because for a number of reasons, all probably quite evident to you, Germany found itself in, uh, in a rather um, odious position of really just uh, being um, initially ostracized and seen pretty much as a pariah. And it's from that difficult position that Adenauer tried slowly but surely to um, regain credibility, certainly not influence, but credibility as, as the first step towards um, a reintegration of Germany in the committee of Western, Western nation. Hadenauer was, um, well, he became, uh, is the first chancellor of West Germany, 
West Germany was established, as you all know, in 1949 by um, the, um, the the welding together of, East, uh, of three occupation zones, the French, the German, and sorry, the French, the American, and, and, and the British. When he became chancellor in 1949, Adenauer was already an old man. In fact, his nickname in Germany was the Alti, which is the old man. He was 79 years old when he became chancellor of, of West Germany. Previously, he had been for a number of years the mayor of Cologne in, uh, in, in Germany. He was briefly uh, imprisoned by, by the Nazi in the early 40s, and he was seen as by the Allies, by the British and the Americans, as a reliable uh, leader that they could possibly trust. However, the task that fell on Adenauer was a difficult one, uh, not simply... Um, internationally, but also domestically. His first government was made possible by the crucial support of the um, German liberals, the FDP. And the first Adenauer government relied on rather tight parliamentary uh, majority in, in the Bundestag. Also, bear in mind that when he became chancellor, Germany was not, West Germany was not a fully independent country. Still, um, it's only 1951 that the Allies, the French, the British, and the Americans allowed West Germany to conduct foreign relations but still under the leash. Adenauer from 1951 to 1955 was also the foreign minister of West Germany. And it's really, it's in, the importance of Adenauer is, um, as a political leader, should not be, um, cannot be uh, overemphasized. It was really under him that Germany really achieved over less than two decades, a major turnaround in its political, political fortunes. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next few minutes. Adenauer's political platform was a pretty much a straightforward one. He had a number of very important political objectives to pursue. The first one, as you all probably um, familiar with, and it's the most evident one, it's almost commonsensical, which is the political rehabilitation of, of the country. So try to regain full sovereignty, but more importantly, to be trusted again by its, its neighbors. Then the second plank of its agenda was economic reconstruction and, and, and prosperity. The country in 1945 was, was pretty much on, on its knees. Important regions of, of Germany had been bombed and, and destroyed. Domestic stability was also another important factor to try to um, establish strong and resilient democratic institutions which would prevent the reemergence of a nasty totalitarian regime. And finally, security. The newly quasi-independent West Germany emerged, as you all are aware with, in the context of a worsening international situation. And therefore, for West Germany, it was quite important to try to, defenseless as it was, to choose its own allies actually quite, quite carefully. And finally, um, reunification. This was quite, um, Adenauer left it very much on the back burner because he thought that in the foreseeable future, there was no chance of unifying 
the two Germanys, West Germany and the D DDR, the Democratic um, Republic of, of Germany, Communist East Germany, in other words. He thought that in the long term, this should be a name, a goal that West Germany should aspire to. But nonetheless, the political conditions right now were, were not favorable. So in a sense, he saw this objective, this goal, as a very long-term one, but at the same time, an unpractical one in, in, in the short and medium term. The political conditions for the reunification of the country were simply not there. And so all these aims, Adenauer argued, should have been achieved and pursued in the context of what he called Westbindung, the link with the West, or alignment with the West, if you prefer. Of course, one aspect of it was German attempts to join NATO, and more broadly the Atlantic Alliance. 1949, 1950, Germany, West Germany, was not one of the funding members of, of NATO. And it was not until 1995 that Germany would become, or rather West Germany would become a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And the second plank of his foreign policy agenda was participation in the process of European integration. And here it's quite interesting, as I will point it out to you, the way in which the Germans played their own cards. Of course, they saw quite clearly what the French were trying to do, if you remember what we said about France last week. But nonetheless, despite all those, um, they of course realized that the, the French were trying to contain Germany. But despite all these French tricks or French attempts to contain Germany, nonetheless, at an hour, so the emerging process of European integration is pretty much the only game in town. Yes, it would constrain Germany to some extent, but it would also provide Germany with the opportunity to rebuild its own reputation. And in fact, one of your, the authors of your reading, Josef Joffe, has put it quite nicely in, in one of the readings that I, I have assigned to you. He spoke of self-abnegation, the denial of oneself as a condition for self-assertion. So let's go through first Adenauer's policies pretty much one by one. Domestically, clearly, economic recovery was a daunting task. Germany had been pretty much destroyed. And um, therefore, in international affairs, its freedom of maneuver was quite limited. First and foremost, there were structural constraints to um, a more active German role in international affairs. Germany came to be West Germany in a very rigid bipolar system with strengthening uh, blocks, the East and the West block. So Germany could not possibly hope to resort to um, what previous German leaders from Bismarck to Gustav Stresemann, and I'll just uh, I'll explain who he was in, in a minute. The usual politics of what um, Josef Joffe has called maneuver and balance, or in German, Schalkel politic, which is the seesaw politics, in a way which is, a, which is, in other words, is a way of playing different and differing opposing faction against each other to um, gain a greater freedom or greater room of maneuver. 
That, of course, was no longer possible in 1949. And one of the reasons also why it was not possible was because West Germany had basically no army until 1955. So you can see the kind of limitations there. It's only 1951, as we saw before, the, the Federal Republic of Germany was allowed to conduct foreign relations. But again, under a light leash to some extent. It's only 1955 that we could argue that Germany, West Germany, became a fully sovereign state. Until then, the Allied Commission controlled the Federal Republic um, of Germany, international relations, and also the Allied High Commission had a say in domestic and economic affairs. And also, we should not forget that the constitution that the Allies imposed on, on Germany was a quite limiting one. The Germans call it the basic law la, rather than the constitution. But the basic law, the constitution imposed constraints on the use of force and not simply the use of force. The key two articles are Article 25 in Article 26. Let me read you first Article 25, which will give you a sense of the kind of limitation that Germans accepted to their own uh, freedom of maneuver. Article 25 of the ba Basic Law uh, says, states that the general rules of international law shall be an integral part of federal law, of German law. They shall take precedence over the laws and directly create rights and duties for the inhabitants of federal, the federal territory. So in other words, it means that international law can and will overrule domestic law if it needs to. And I can't think of any other state I'm familiar with that has accepted derogation to its sovereignty to um, international rules and regulations. Article 26, comma 1, acts tending to and undertaken with intent to disturb the peaceful relations between nations, especially to prepare for a war of aggression, shall be unconstitutional. They shall be made a criminal offense. So you can see here, here again under what legal limitations German leaders uh, were operating under post-1949. So you can see that there were a number of limitations and restrictions to West Germany's freedom of maneuver. Uh, systemic, the international system and the Cold War, military, political, and legal. And that's why uh, traditional methods of conducting foreign policy were no longer feasible and possible. The so-called shackle politic, the seesaw politics, so call it maneuver and balance if you prefer, was no longer possible. One of the most or best known practitioner of this kind of policy was um, one of the longest serving German chancellor of the past 200 years, Otto von Bismarck. Chancellor for 18, from 1871 to 1890, and he played a very sensible and shrewd uh, diplomatic game to try to prevent two major continental powers, France and Russia, from coalescing together, from forming a coalition against, against Germany. He was very able at... Um, um, keeping them apart and ensuring that playing each of them against each other so that Germany would not be threatened 
by or encircled by the Russian on the east and the French and, and the French on the west. The really strategic nightmare that German leaders always feared in those years and, and after. But the same Hadenauer, in a sense, was even in a worse position than his predecessors after the, first, the end of the First World War. As you all know, Germany was a defeated power even in, in 1919, at the end of the, 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 second, the First World War, and then was not even invited at the, the Paris Conference in 1919. The German peace treaty was meted out on the Germans as a diktat, take it or leave it. They didn't even have the chance to discuss it. But nonetheless, back then, the Germany that came out of the First World War managed to remain united. A single country was not divided. Yes, significant um, constraints were imposed on, on, on the German Reich in, in 1919, but nonetheless, the country was not dismembered. And in fact, in those years, still from a position of weakness, post-World War I German leaders, and first and foremost, Gustav Stresemann, who was briefly chancellor in 1923, but then foreign minister for almost a decade, from 1923 to 1929, Stresemann, even from a position of weakness, was able to play the usual game of seesaw politics between East and West. Just let me give you two pointers, just to give you a sense of um, what I'm trying to say. In any case, what I'm about to say won't be in your test, so you can relax there. I won't take you back to 1922. But Stresemann actually was quite skillful, and his, pre his predecessors and his successors quite skillful at really taking advantage of what emerged out of the ashes of World War I. In 1922, the Germans signed the Treaty of Rapallo. Rapallo is a small seaside town in northern Italy, uh, with the Soviet Union. That was a quite smooth, smart, because it provided for the resumption of diplomatic relations between the two countries, so the Germany could also, by becoming friendlier to the Soviet Union, could possibly use the Soviet Union as leverage to gain better relations with the West. But more importantly was the economic and military cooperation that the Russians or the Soviets and the Germans were able to establish. In fact, secret military collaboration that worked quite nicely for the Soviet Union as well as for the Germans. And in fact, when Germany was trying to move somewhat closer to the Soviet Union, those steps, those attempts, were, didn't go unnoticed and uh, unheeded in Western Europe. In 1925, the French, the Italians, and the British, to some extent, tried to bring Germany into the Western fold of, of nations by the Locarno Agreement. The Locarno Agreement, without boring you with diplomatic details, was an attempt made by the United Kingdom, France, and Italy to forge a wider security system which would include Germany itself. The United Kingdom and Italy would guarantee the Franco-Belgian and German border. And for the Germans, this was a major achievement because the Germans were fearful of the French and actually, by Italy and England, uh, sorry, England, uh, Britain and Italy guaranteeing the Franco-German border, it also meant if the French would by any chance, for any reason, attack Germany, for any justifiable reason, the Italians and the British were supposed to intervene on the German side. Vice versa, if the Germans, for whatever reason, attacked unjustifiably the French, the others two would have to intervene on the French side. But here you can see that there was a quite successful attempt to um, 
make Germany again an equal to all, to all the others. But this was no longer possible to, to, uh, to add an hour. So no longer uh, shackled politics, CISO po politics moving from playing the East and Western blocks or Eastern and Western countries against each other. The only possible political option that Adenauer felt uh, German, West Germany should and could pursue was a political and economic integration with Western Europe. Adenauer and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were quite keen and open to the new plans for Europe. They clearly realized that the Schumann and the Pleven plans that we discussed last week briefly were designed and intended to contain the Federal Republic of Germany. But interestingly, Adenauer saw in these plans as the real opportunity to rehabilitate Germany and to get real advantages out of it. And just let me list you some of the advantages that Adenauer um, thought that European integration would bring to West Germany. First, by joining the European coal and steel community and then the European economic community, Germany would be treated as an equal by neighbors, no longer pariah state. Secondly, Germany would regain their trust. The process of European integration, as you clearly understood, was not simply a political uh, concoction. But if you like, was also a framework where political socialization could take place. Leaders could get to know each other, could mingle amongst each other, and therefore they could start to talk to each other more confidently and slowly but surely regain their trust. Germany would be tied more deeply to Western Europe. And that was, it had also domestic implication, as we shall see. Adenauer saw this link with other Western neighbors as a way of preventing any drift into totalitarianism or autocracy again. Finally, to regain sovereignty, slowly but surely. And finally, Western European integration, seen by Adenauer, was also regarded as a key to prevent the resurgence of militarism. So Germany didn't really need to rearm. If by any chance West Germany managed to establish a strong and working relationships across the continent, the idea of rearming would almost uh, become redundant. At least that was Adenauer thinking in those, in those years. And here again, a quote by Josef uh, Joffe, one of your, um, the author of one of your readings. Again, he put it quite nicely. For the Federal Republic, integration with Western Europe was a high profit venture. I stress it, a high profit venture. Because it traded non-existing potential rights for actual, even if partial, sovereignty. And from that position, Adenauer could then, um, over time, hope to strengthen Germany bargaining power and negotiating influence within the European institution, as precisely it has happened over the years. Here you can see him next to um, Winston, Winston Churchill. However, before we take a break, don't think for a second that the German political scene was entirely quiet and uncontroversial, that everyone really bought into uh, Adenauer uh, domestic and international plans. In fact, he faced throughout the 50s a pretty tough domestic opposition represented by the SPD or SDP, the Social Democrat Democratic Party, which actually was quite opposed to his policy, I mean Hadenauer's policy, of Westpolitik slash Westbindung. 
The social democrats opposed uh, this politic because they argued with some reason that a strong link with the West would perpetuate the divisions of Germany. The only way in which Germany could hope to be reunified for the Social Democrats was if West Germany was to become a neutral country. And if West Germany became a neutral country, the likelihood of a possible bargain with East Germans, and more importantly with the Russian, would um, be possible. In fact, in those years, the Russian more than once made the point that we're willing to consider the reunification of the country if you, West Germany, loosen your links with the West and become neutral. Under those conditions, the Russians told the West Germans, told Adenauer, we would be willing to consider a reunification of, of the country with the proviso that the, then the reunited Germany would still be a neutral country. Adenauer saw it as a ploy of, of course, pushing West Germany outside the emerging alliance um, with, with the West. And he never really entertained the, the idea, but the Social Democrats did. The Social Democrats were also opposed to um, the European and Coal and Steel community, as many other socialist or communist party across, across the Western world. I can think of the Italian Communist Party and to some extent the Italian Socialist Party and also the uh, French Communist Party in those years. Kurt Schumacher, the leader of the um, SPD or the Social Democrats, you can see him uh, portrayed there, argued that actually the European coal and steel community, the process of European integration, was deeply pernicious. It was the embodiment of um, rough capitalism, actually oligopolistic um, capitalism. Use the words, of course, capitalism and cartels, which alludes to, if you like, an oligopolistic uh, capitalist system. And also because the process of European integration was pretty much pursued by Christian democratic parties like um, Adenauer's own party or like the Christian Democrats in France and the Christian Democrats in Italy, he thought that actually the process of European integration was smacked far too much of clericalism and conservative, conservatism. So he mentioned the four C's, although in Germany would be the four, in German would be the four K, because K is because all these words start with K and not with C. And also he was opposed to the CDU, the Christian Democratic uh, Union, which was, which was Adenauer's party, the Christian Democrats, free market economic agenda. It's only in 1959 at this famous conference, for those of you interested in, in German politics, uh, Bad Godesberg conference in 1959, that the SPD became a, a less radical party, abandoned left-wing radicalism, and endorsed actually Adenauer's agenda of membership of NATO as well as Western European integration. So by then, from the 60s onwards, you pretty much uh, have bipartisanship on key foreign policy issues. And before we take a break, we could argue that really by 1963, when Adenauer retired, Westpolitik and Westbindung paid their dividends quite handsomely. Federal Republic of Germany became increasingly tied, enmeshed, engaged with the West. By 1955, it had achieved almost full equality with its partners. I remember it joined NATO in 1955. In 1955, Allied control ended over foreign policy and domestic issues. 
However, there were remaining constraints. Germany, West Germany would only join European, uh, sorry, the United Nations in 1973. Still, uh, until the end of the Cold War, there were limitations on West Germany, on the kind of weapon system that Germany could possibly buy or possess. And also, only in 1990, Germany regained full control over West Berlin. But by and large, Westpolitik really delivered the framework in which the Federal Republic of Germany could possibly, could possibly prosper. And let me show you just uh, this um, brief video. It's a visit by, and then we take a break, by Konrad Adenauer to, to Washington in the early 60s, meeting President uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And to some extent, uh, it's one of those moments where you start appreciating that Germany, while still playing um, uh, flying low, nonetheless, its prestige, its, 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 its reputation uh, has grown from the low po start point of 1949. Just it's a brief, brief video clip. Oh, they should have the sound. Well, there was, there's no point of showing you <laughs> a video clip without, without, just, uh, without a sound. But nonetheless, you can see Adenauer just meeting, uh, shaking now hands with Dean Rask, walking with, um, with John Fitzgerald Kennedy. It's, um, it's the North Lawn of the, the White House here, Jacqueline Kennedy. And to some extent, it's just uh, this brief video clip was supposed to um, convey to you the... Um, growing and an emerging relationship between West Germany and, and the United States. But since I must have done something quite um, funny, just as a, when I was uploading this video clip, we have no sound. So I'll suggest we take a break for 10 minutes and then we come back um, briefly to Adenauer in, um, in the next part of, of the lecture.
Okay, so uh, let's look at the, um, the advantages and benefits that um, Adenauer's policy of, of close links with, uh, with the United States and the rest of Western Europe uh, um, allowed uh, Germany, West Germany to achieve. In terms of its domestic achievements, uh, by pursuing close links with, with the West, uh, West Germany was able to consolidate its, its democracy. As I said before, um, don't imagine for a second that the, the German political scene was rather placid. In reality, it became a quite competitive, uh, vibrant democracy. Adenauer was able to strengthen Western, West Germany's liberal in institutions and make them actually quite effective. To strengthen the uh, CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, and the CSU electoral appeal. The CSU are the Christian Democrats' uh, sister party or brother party in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Bavaria, in, in the south of, of Germany. And throughout the, the ninth, throughout his period, um, throughout the 50s and early 60s, Adenauer would be able to govern Germany, West Germany, with uh, not an overcomfortable majority, but nonetheless with, with, with um, a safe one. Um, the West German political system was, prevent, was able to prevent the resurgence of nationalism. And in fact, I don't know of any other country amongst those defeated powers like Japan and Italy and Germany, I don't know any other country that has gone into such great depth in dealing with its controversial, controversial past. Uh, German political leaders have been very thorough in, in this respect in trying really to um, rethink German, Germany's controversial past and really made an effort to ensure that um, um, a nasty brand of nationalism would be rooted out. And also he was quite capable, the shrewd politician that he was, to prevent, um, to make sure that the um, Social Democrats would remain in opposition for a significant part of, of the Cold War, pretty much until the 70s. Very briefly, also in terms of the link with the West and the growing economic links with, with, with the United States and the rest of Europe through the emerging process of in, uh, European integration really allowed um, West German economic recovery to be a, an extremely good one, a sustained one, and throughout the, uh, the 50s an exceptional one because Germany, West Germany grew at the pace of 8% per annum, which nowadays we would dream of. Of course, to some extent, um, West Germany was um, helped in a way. In fact, some of you in your policy reviews, uh, a couple of you, uh, mentioned the 1953 agreement that Germany reached with the Allies, the so-called London Debt Agreement, which was a big help. It eliminated half of Germany's external debt with uh, the United States, Britain, and other European countries, and also to create a generous repayment um, conditions for, for Germany. Only very recently, Germany was able to repay its entire war debt. And that was quite, it's not to be, uh, it's a factor that shouldn't be uh, um, ignored. If you compare the way in which West Germany was treated uh, in the 50s and the way in which Germany was treated at the end of the First World War, the issue of reparations after the First World War was a hugely controversial one in, um, in Germany, was an issue um, on which Hitler would harp and 
uh, make political millage, a significant political millage, but more to the point, the reparations regime in the 20s to some extent contributed to um, Germany weak and unsettled economic situation, which then provided the fertile ground for the emergence of radical parties, the communists as well as uh, the Nazis. So you can see that economic stability is always quite important, I think, in terms of entrenching uh, a democratic regime and making it uh, viable in, in the long term. Also, rapid economic growth was made possible by free market econo economics, although, of course, I realize that nowadays making this, this statement is quite, is quite controversial. Uh, there's, there's a growing number of critics of free market economics, but being an historian and look at the way in which Western economies, and not simply Western economies, I can think of other countries like India, China, have grown out of and become wealthier, must have something to do with free market economies like that, uh, unlike centrally managed economies, for instance. Then the Marshall Plan, of course, was a major, a major help in, in that respect. And the amount of allied funds that trickled into West Germany. Also, to bear in mind the huge immigration um, into the, the Federal Republic of Germany in the 50s and 60s, coming from East Germany. By 1960, 20% of its population was not born in the Federal Republic of Germany. A significant part of them were East, Germany, East German seeking freedom and skilled people leaving East Germany for West Germany but also on skilled work, workers coming from other regions of, of the, what became the European economic communities, from other countries in the European economic communities, working in German mines or German um, industries. And I think the German miracle was also based on a, on a skilled and cooperative workforce. So again, the ability of the German um, society and, and politics to try even within, with, even if, of course, political parties were pushing different political lines, nonetheless, the workforce was not a radical one, was quite willing to, to, um, to work with business to, to, um, to ensure that just German, German firms would, try, uh, would prosper long, long term. So you can see how the uh, Institutional context, the, uh, the German, if you like, um, decisions to, to join, to join um, Western alliances and increase those, those links with its neighbors and the United States actually paid a huge, a huge dividend even economically. You should compare with West Germany, which is the topic of this lecture today, with the prevailing conditions at the time in, in the East. However, if one wants and has to be critical of this politic and this being doing, um, is that inevitably closer alignment with the West foreclose other opportunities, other possibilities. One possibility was the reunification of uh, Germany. But adding our position, as, I hinted at, as I, I've hinted at before, was that the Soviet, Soviet proposal of reunited but neutralized Germany was a trap, was a ploy. He thought that a neutral and reunited Germany would fall prey to Soviet influence. If West Germany loosened its links with the United States first and foremost, would inevitably fall under the influence of, of, of the Soviet Union. At least that was, of course, Adenauer's uh, way of thinking. 
And in fact, he thought that the tones or re relaxation of tensions between the two blocks were a kind of threat to Germany. And that's why throughout his career, Adenauer can also be regarded as a, prima, a quintessential Cold War warrior. He saw peaceful coexistence and then the taunt as, as something suspicious. If the taunt takes place and, 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 and if peaceful coexistence is strengthened, then surely the Americans and the Russians will start talking to each other more frequently. And from Adenauer's point of view, as he made very clear, the possibility of the Americans and the Russians reaching agreements over the heads of Germans would inevitably increase. He thought that in the Cold War context, the security of West Germany could be uh, only um, achieved through a close link with the West. And therefore, anything else, like the unification of the country, had to wait even because he thought that in the long term only a strong Federal Republic of Germany could perhaps conceive of negotiating successfully with the, with the Russians only if West Germany uh, found itself in a position of stre strength, prosperous, rich, and assured of, of itself. Here, by the way, you can see Adenauer with uh, Nikita Khrushchev in 1955 and Bulganin. When he goes for the first time to Moscow, I had a video for you, but since I realized that just there's no sound, I don't know why, I just uh, tested out before I came here, but there's no sound, I must have, done, must have been my faulty tower moment. Um, in 1955, he goes to Moscow, and the, the Russian made very clear to, to him, look, it's, uh, we're not completely opposed to reunification. In fact, I think reunification would be highly desirable. But nonetheless, what we want from you is that you consider the idea of reunited by neutral Germany. And of course, Adenauer made quite clear that that was not what he was having in, in mind. Let's briefly move to, um, not necessarily to the second phase that as, as I mentioned before, but just an intermediate phase, very briefly, where by the, really by the second half of the Cold War, Germany is able to regain its initiative. And here you can see Adenauer next to Charles de Gaulle. In the early 60s, however, late 50s, early 60s, um, Germany built on the emerging process of European integration to, to forge closer relations with, 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 uh, with France. He was not entirely uh, trustful of the United States. He thought that the United States, under certain circumstances, like detente and peaceful coexistence, could possibly so sell Germany down, down the drain. He was afraid that, particularly under Kennedy, this new young and untested American president, the Americans could be tempted to end East-West confrontation. In fact, Kennedy often spoke about the idea of just uh, reducing tensions with, with the Soviet Union. And if that was indeed what the Americans were trying to do, then the Germans should be very careful because the Americans would try, would agree perhaps with the Soviet Union to neutralize Germany. But the Americans, neither Kennedy nor Johnson or Nixon ever considered really the, the option, the idea of neutralizing Germany. But nonetheless, since the Adenauer felt that this, actually, that this could be a possibility, that's the reason why, to some extent, he moved closer to France. And that's why he perceived European integration as also an extra um, factor, if you like, in ensuring that um, Germany would remain tightly close to, to the West. And we spoke about last week, really in the 60s, the Franco-German axis became the driving force of European integration. 
As we mentioned last week, and I'll be very brief on, the, on this, uh, the Elise Treaty or the Friendship Treaty of 1963 really was uh, the capstone on a burgeoning um, political and economic relation between Germany and France. The treaty established regular consultations between the two countries, foreign policy coordination, and also enhanced cultural and youth uh, exchanges. So, if you like, almost, uh, if I were to use this word, quite new age, which is holistic, uh, this was a sort of quite holistic way of rethinking and thinking about the relationship between these two countries. However, don't think for a second that Hadenauer shared all the gold views and, and visions. Unlike the goal, he wanted a more integrated Europe. And unlike the goal, he wanted this more integrated Europe solidly close to the United States and NATO. While France, if you remember from last week, wanted a stronger EC, but not a more integrated one, a stronger but not more integrated one. And certainly, if you, if you remember from last week, the goal was in two minds, to put it mildly, about the continuing presence of the United States in, in Europe. So it's fair to say that while as, uh, Adenauer worked tirelessly to improve relations with, with the gold France, nonetheless, he never went as far as, um, as really undermining NATO and as far as espousing the gold's radical agenda. And even his successors, Herod from his uh, same party, and then uh, Kissinger, were quite skeptical of the goal in his sort of anti-NATO uh, campaign. Uh, the Germans were quite adamant on this point. We're willing to work with you even more closely, but provided that you don't question NATO and you're undermining it. Because if we have to make a choice, we'll choose NATO and the United States over France. Briefly again, the in, in, in the 70s, this is another interesting moment in uh, German foreign policy because with the emergence of the taunt at international level, with um, Nixon starting to negotiate with, with the Soviet Union and as well as the Nixon administration negotiating with, with China, the famous opening to China under Nixon, you have, if you like, um, a period of quite significant fluidity in, in international affairs. And it's within this emerging fluidity in international affairs that you also start seeing West German steps towards a more, perhaps, original foreign policy. It's in the 1970s that successive German governments uh, embrace the concept of Ostpolitik. Um, if you like, um, the attempt to establish closer ties with, with Eastern Europe. The architect of Ostpolitik was uh, Willy Brandt. He had been, in the earlier Cold War, the mayor of West Berlin and then became leader of the Social Democrats. And in 19, from 1969 to 1974, he was the German Chancellor. And he perceived uh, a diminished, diminished um, dependence on the West as allowing West Germany to play a more, um, if you like, a more proactive, a more daring role in, in at least in European affairs. Willy Brandt thought that um, the taunt really provided perhaps the framework for allowing growing uh, links with East Germany. Lesser tension at the international level would make possible, from his point of view, closer political and economic links with East Germany. 
And that's why in the early 70s, he quite proactively went about um, trying to uh, reduce tensions with, with the Soviet Union. Uh, he signed treaties with, with Poland and East Germany to reassure the East Germans and the Poles that Germany had no unfriendly intention. And what he thought was that through reassuring a number of Eastern European nations and the Soviet as well, that, that Germany had no ill intention in pursuing its policy of Ostpolitik, Willy Brandt was hoping that, just that the conditions eventually would emerge for much closer relations with East Germany and ultimately uh, the unification of the country. His idea was that if over the long term, if the international situation stabilized, remained quite promising, the West German economic and political model would to some extent attract the East Germans and to some extent induce them to consider reunification. Its, his successor, Helmut uh, Schmidt, another um, social democratic politician, pursued the same policy really until the early 80s when the international situation worsened after the uh, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. And then we re-entered for a number of years um, a period of tension in, uh, in uh, East-West uh, relations. But throughout this period, nonetheless, as the Germans were trying to um, establish closer and more uh, beneficial relations with the East, nonetheless, they made it very clear that the key um, aim, the key, um, if, you, if you like, the lodestar in their foreign policy was a continuing alignment with its Western neighbors. And now let's come to the second phase in German foreign policy, and I want to leave some, 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 some time to it, it's putting aside some, some time to it. Really, the, second, the, the end of the Cold War is a significant moment in German foreign policy because, again, the Germans now have to try to respond to significant changes at international and European, European level which was the collapse, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the political mayhem uh, that, that, that political development br brought about. And again, here again, although the situation was fast changing, a new German leader, Helmut Kohl, who would be the German Chancellor from 1982 really to 1998, again, the way he went about dealing with the collapse of the Berlin Wall was pretty much along very well-tested lines. And again, the idea that through self-abnegation, Germany could uh, possibly reassert itself in the long term. And what I mean by it in this case, it was by reassuring Germany's, West Germany's neighbors about the impending unification of the country or the possible unification of the country that there was nothing to fear from a reunited Germany. A reunited Germany would remain peaceful and closely integrated with, with the West. And in fact, uh, again, he strove to make sure that Germany or the reunited Germany would really be again tightly uh, linked to, to Europe. And that's the reason why Germany agreed to further European integration and as you're all familiar with, it also agreed to surrendering its um, national currency, the Deutsch Mark. The Deutsch Mark through, throughout the Cold War was seen as the clearest example of the success story that post-war Germany came to be. It was the living example of Germany regaining the status of economic powerhouse in, in Europe. It was, if you like, um, a symbol of, of prestige. But nonetheless, the reunification was not, did not simply come to a heavy cost because of surrendering 
the Deutsche Mark, in order to get the Russians, the, uh, Gorbachev, to agree to the reunification of the country, Kohl made a number of important commitments. He told the Russians that yes, a reunited Germany would be happy to reduce its overall defense forces by 40%. So that the overall um, figure, including West German forces and East German forces, should be reduced by 40%. And then the commitment to avoid pursuing nuclear weapons. Of course, Germany throughout the Cold War has had the technological know-how and scientific know-how to produce nuclear weapons if it wanted to. But it never went down the path and Kohl made it clear once again. It also made clear that Germany, United Germany, would renounce all territorial claims against Poland and the Soviet Union. It's a long story, but we won't go into, into that one. The legacies of the First and the Second World War, if you like. And then the United Germany would pay a significant amount of money 12 million Deutsche Mark um, for the withdrawal of German, uh, Russian forces from the German Democratic Republic, East, East, East Germany. But nonetheless, you can see how once the unification was attained, yes, it was costly in many ways. Yes, giving up the euro was quite controversial. Giving up the Deutsche Mark, I apologize was quite controversial at the time. There were a number of Germans uh, from different political quarters arguing, not simply political leaders or politicians, but also the common men in, in the common panther in the street arguing, why, is it, why should we give up the Deutsche Mark? In what way would European monetary integration um, improve the, um, the living conditions of, of, the, um, of a common German. To what extent would benefit us? And why would we want to um, embark on relinquishing sovereignty, economic and financial and fiscal sovereignty to some extent to the European Union? Again, it wasn't... Um, it was a quite controversial, quite, I would say quite vibrant debate within Germany in those early years of the 90s. Nonetheless, Kohl was determined to pursue that path. He was determined and keen to make sure that through greater European integration, Germany would be even more tightly embedded to the rest of the continent. You could argue that he was, in many ways, he even spoke quite uh, passionately about a federal Europe eventually emerging um, in the coming decades. In a sense, he was, uh, he was dreaming, of course, but nonetheless, he, he indulged even in more grandiose visions of European unity. He certainly believed in it. But the way they negotiated... Um, the, um, the monetary integration and the, the euro regime, currency regime, in a sense, it's another telling German story. The while, real, while raising um, lofty principle, nonetheless, the Germans negotiated very, very toughly, as of, often do. And the way in which the Eurozone was conceived and then implemented bear to some significant extent uh, the imprints of, or the fingertips of Chancellor Kohl. For instance, just to give you a few examples, the growing stability pact, the set of criteria that were supposed to govern the Eurozone were very much um, a German 
concoction in, 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 in many ways. The fact that budget deficit must not exceed 3% of the GDP, or the fact that government, government debt must not exceed 60% of the GDP, these were all German ideas. And also the idea that a central bank should be established, the European Central Bank should be established, again, the way in which it was established and the way in which it was implemented, it was and it was designed, it was designed pretty much along the line of the German um, Bundesbank. So again, the idea of uh, the, the idea of monetary integration at German wishes and concerns writ large in, uh, in, in, in many ways. And what did Germany gain from it? Actually, Germany, I would argue, uh, gained from benefit from it quite handsomely for a number of reasons. The first one is probably the most obvious one, that who shapes the rules of, of a particular regime or um, of particular situation, a particular game, of course, uh, profits most from, from, from this game by ensuring that the Eurozone would somehow, uh, the way in which, in which it was conceived, was responding to German concerns, ensure that somehow Germany would be, um, come out of it actually better off. And one way, one of the most, uh, also most evident advantages of uh, um, monetary integration was that by Europeanizing the Deutsche Mark, if I could put it that way, Germany reassured its neighbors. And then again, it's not something to be uh, dismissed. After all, uh, through the process of European integration, as we will see in a minute, Germany found itself in many ways in an unprecedented position, surrounded by friends and not by, by enemies. And finally, by adopting a common currency and being one of the most um, um, productive um, countries within the Eurozone, Germany was able to ensure that with the common currency and with the ability to produce more cheaply, its ability to export to the rest of the Union and also the rest of the Eurozone would be enhanced. So with all other countries, or if I can give an example, France and Italy, for instance, or Spain, much lesser able to produce a lower prices than Germany, and now with the impossibility of devaluing their own currencies, Germany found itself in an inviolable position. Rachel? Everyone knew, no, that's, that's a good question, because I remember back in those days, I was making the point, because a number of, for instance, a number of my friends were saying, well, actually, Italy won't benefit from, from joining the euro, because unless we become more efficient in many ways, or, or more able to produce lower costs, um, we won't uh, be able to compete, we won't be able to devalue, and therefore we won't be able to compete uh, with, with, with the Germans. As and everyone knew what the, polit the economic consequences of monetary union, it was that you'd be successful within the, uh, the Eurozone if you became more, how to put it, um, more efficient, more virtuous in terms of the number of economic policies. So I would argue that I haven't been able to see German cabinet papers or the discussions that took place within, 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 within Germany, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that, that they knew, of course, if they just remain um, efficient, they would benefit from, from, from this game. 
Thanks for the question. And here, just briefly, a cartoon that to some extent it's um, Peter Brooks uh, used to draw from the Times of London, one, a cheeky cartoonist. Um, here, to some extent, it, it really tries to capture the essence of the European Monetary Union and the way in which the Germans were quite able to shape it to their own, their own liking. And I think these cartoons really just, you can see the face of, the big face of Chancellor Kohl um, turning into a euro currency symbol, how they developed the euro symbol. So I think Peter Brooks is just uh, is cheekiest. Finally, however, it's fair to say that, uh, and coming to some extent, um, to add a further dimension to the question that uh, Rachel just asked. However, the Eurozone, um, the, the creation of European currency, um, it wasn't completely, wasn't, it still was a gamble for the Germans, and still nowadays it's a gamble for, for the Germans because while the system has worked so far quite nicely for, for, for Germany, nonetheless has also made Germany potentially liable to, um, to other countries. As you're familiar with, and in fact some of you discussed these points in your policy reviews, each member of the Eurozone uh, contributes for instance, has contributed to um, um, making loans to Greece, or has contributed to the two small firewall uh, schemes that are currently uh, in place. So it's not simply that it's only Germany liable to the others. For instance, all the others are liable to, uh, to for instance, Greece, or if one country goes Goes, goes bankrupt, all the others are also exposed. So in that respect, the end, we don't know the end of the story, but so far Germany has certainly done pretty nicely out of it. So in the last 10 years, really German foreign policy has been strongly influenced by or driven by a number of factors, certainly traditional Europeanism. Again, the adoption of the Euro and Germany's support for the Eurozone is not purely mercantilist, if you, way, if you, if you like, but it's based on a strong um, Europeanism. The belief that uh, it's only through European integration that Germany is able to prosper and also to remain safe and, and secure. And also the Euro provides the the geopolitical and institutional context, and by Europe I mean the European Union, of course, for Germany to, to prosper. And just, again, what I was briefly hinting at just a few minutes ago, just compare these two maps of, of, of Europe. This one that dates back to the pre-1945, um, pre-World War II period, and the current one. And now Germany is surrounded by, by friends with the um, added bonus that Russia is not as threatening as the Soviet Union was in the 20s and 30s and during the Cold War. But if we look back to the 20s and 30s, well, Germany was surrounded by a number of adversaries, France was one, Britain was not quite keen on, 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 on Germany in the 20s and 30s, let me put it that way. Italy until, until the mid-30s, actually Mussolini was not particularly pro-German, he was careful, even concerned about Germany. He was no friend of Germany, to cut a long story short. The French, for instance, were very active in uh, Central and Eastern Europe in trying to create a bulwark against Germany itself. In fact, in the 20s and 30s, particularly early 30s, 
the French were very active in striking deals with the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Poles, and even 1935, mind you, the French signed a military convention with the Soviets. And likewise, the Soviets did with the French. So, in a sense, two ideological rivals coming together for the sake of containing Germany. So you can see how 50 years later, or 70 years later even, how the, the geopolitical map of Europe has changed for the Germans, and to what benefit. And also broad, to come back to um, German thinking, broad support for greater political and fiscal integration is also seen as a way of um, really ensuring long-term Germany security and prosperity. But nonetheless, German foreign policy, it could be argued, has also been assertive and, and timid. Germany has quite not um, delivered on the leadership thing, has certainly been way more willing and proactive to impose its own desires and, wishing and wishes, for instance, more fiscal control on profligate states, but also has been reluctant to go too far in, in forging greater bailout schemes as well as accepting euro bonds. The art, one of the arguments that Kunani has made, well, if the Germans have come to the conclusion, as they did, that the Eurozone has been so beneficial to them, so why not making greater sacrifices? Because as long as Germany doesn't make those sacrifices, then the system is at risk, as, again, a number of you have pointed out in your policy, policy reviews. And also, German policy has been, in a number of ways, logical and contradictory. Greater austerity that the Germans have pushed for a number of sensible reasons, in fact, could lead to um, greater deficits down the line. So, in a sense, almost providing a self-fulfilling prophecy of doom and, and gloom. And also bear in mind that the political landscape in Germany is also changing. Angela Merkel's successors within the CDU, the Christian Democrat Union, are not as Europeanist as Merkel themselves, herself. In fact, they're way more skeptical about European integration than Merkel herself. So watch, watch, really watch th th that space. German foreign policy, to some extent, will be evolving um, if once uh, Merkel uh, gets out of the way. And in any case, she's been weakened politically over the past uh, two or three years, especially um, because of the way she dealt with the migrant crisis in 20, 2015. But really, to bring this long lecture to, to a conclusion, this time on time, finally, after third time lucky. What I wanted to, uh, the point I was planning to make to you, and I hope I, I conveyed it to, to some, to, um, somewhat effectively, was that really post-1945 German foreign policy was based on a number of key principles that you may want to keep in mind, that, um, that of rapid political and economic rehabilitation and this was done to what Joseph, uh, Joseph Joff said, self-abnegation as a condition for self-assertion, once again. Also through West politic, um, the policy towards the West, as well as West Bindung, the link with the West, that meant close and warm relations with the United States and NATO, strong support from the process for the process of Western European integration, and also close 
a close rapport with France, which still nowadays, despite um, some quarrels, still um, is quite still strong. Also, another important factor which I have outlined at the start and perhaps dropped somewhat through the course of this lecture was Germany's enduring commitment to multilateralism and soft power. In fact, still nowadays, to some extent, we could, certainly we could describe Germany as a civilian power. To some extent, we can still describe it as, as, as a trading power. But more to the point for you is to, start to assess whether there's any merit in the concept of Germany as a strategic, geostrategic power. In a way, um, to, to, to signify that Germany, through its uh, growing economic power and influence, to some extent will in, be increasingly tempted and able to um, impose its own views and interests.